Welcome back to Guardians of Gaia, connecting people to planet on Channel 263. Today we explore the topic of South Africa's continuing struggle for a clean energy future. But what are the energy issues that we are struggling with? Let's hear from residents around Cape Town. Uh, currently in Bishop Leibis, um, one of the biggest problems uh, concerning electricity is cost because we have families that must actually choose between whether they want to buy electricity or whether they want to buy food. Um, and then uh, the second biggest problem, obviously, load shedding, because as soon as there's load shedding, it gives rise to rape, shootings, knife things, it immediately increases. Um, then there's also one, one very big problem that we have currently, um, specifically in Bishop Labors, um, we used to have these um, big lamp posts that brightened up the whole area. Um, the city changed it to the small, duller ones, and um, you cannot see anything. This, um, so if somebody walks past you, you don't even know who that person is. And um, I think that is the one thing that we are uh, definitely are going to fight because. It's a huge problem for our community. The cost is the, the biggest problem. We want to do away with the cost thing. We cannot afford it. If we sit here on my own rent, we have extra money. We have extra rent. So we have units as a 5,4 per unit. If we have extra rent. And then we have extra money. Like it will run. Number two, kuna kuna macho kiumbi shakes. Kuna macho kiumbi alape enex door court. Kuna mada bashala zetene. Kuna mada bashala macho kiumbi. So indo enzekayo. Aba ba mada bashala macho kiumbi. Baba umba ni kui poles ne for ulai tezen tenza. Number three, kuna danger. Let the angel in is next to a community on it. So, I'm going to have a lala pacu. Let the angel in. So, facilitate the number of spal, such as the color let the angel I be because the safety of a good on it. This is the end. Ubacubeco in Dow. Our proposal thing is what corner um money in the Dagama spal. I got a corner per terminus. But he is moving. He is moving. He is moving. He is Ishala inyanga inyanga si 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 kuna zin kuna bantu sabakelo yabon inyanga kwa kuna ezi zinzo zaza zaki watu 2010 58 houses from 2010 and then from 2010 supposed to bangi na baba ndo on December zaza vandalize ezi zin so 2014 zaki ndiyo zaza starta off so kiwa ezi zin to rebuild zaki wa Ko 2014, ko 2014 on December, I was born. Ko 2015, I was my own subsidy in 2014. But I was born in half. I was born because of the one, the one, the one, the one, the one, the one, the one. So, okay, this is still, we're still waiting. It's a waiting list for two, the projects of the Zim. Like the backyard is the somewhat that we haven't got house. I've got no house. I've been in, in for, I've, I've, I've been in a, in a waiting list from 1993. They said to us, okay, Kukulet is going to build for Kukulet, we're going to build for the Kukulet. Nothing from 1993. I've been in a waiting list. All the backyarders, most of them in Kukuletu, are the pensioners. 
we all we will all suffer in the pensioners, we all suffer in because the landlords if you've got no money to buy the the, the landlord they don't they don't buy electricity because they has, they know that the backyarders are there, they're going to buy. We are suffering with backyarders. We please ask them, just make just assist us with boxes because we can buy our own our own electricity. We've just heard about energy struggles in Cape Town, particularly impacting women as they manage households and energy consumption. Gabriel Klaassen from Project 90 by 2030 spoke to us about the role of youth in shaping South Africa's energy system. Lorna Fuller from Project 90 by 2030 spoke to us about their work with communities to secure access and affordability in the energy sector. So Gabriel, tell us, how is the climate change and also the energy sector in South Africa affecting youth? So one way that I've seen that uh, climate change and uh, the energy sector has affected youth in South Africa has been uh, through the social injustices and the economic injustices that we face. Of course, environmental injustice is a massive aspect because that's the first thing that people think about. But when it comes to jobs and uh, livelihoods, that's where we really see young people um, not only focus, but also uh, feel the lived experience and reality. You know, we oftentimes think of climate change as an abstract thing, as something that's not tangible. But uh, in fact, so many of us are facing the impacts of climate change and uh, the decisions of our leaders today. Well, Gabriel, 74% of the youth of South Africa are currently unemployed. What does a clean energy future actually look like? So one thing I've done um, is through the studies and the different reports that many different organizations and members of civil society have released, is try and understand what is being said. Um, so, so many times and often uh, we find that uh, the, the paperwork that comes out is very uh, disconnected from the community. And so it's very difficult for young people to understand what's being said. And one thing I've really focused on is and seen is that through a just energy transition, so an equitable transition from the um, heavily uh, monopolized fossil fuel uh, intensive industry that we live in today and work with today um, toward a one that is more uh, socially owned or um, community owned renewable energy and alternatives. Um, we find opportunity for young people to not only um, define what they want their future to be in energy, but just in society in general, um, opportunities through green jobs, but also through uh, initiatives that kind of rethink and re-envision what our future could look like. Um, that's definitely what I see um, as opportunity. As you said, 74.7% perhaps of young people in South Africa are unemployed. And uh, when talking about um, the way forward, oftentimes uh, we look at what is jobs going to look like for, for community members. But when we talk about community members, we think of older community members, not necessarily the younger ones. And so I definitely think that through um, a revision and a, a kind of more cleaner and more uh, renewable energy uh, of future, uh, we find opportunities for young people to take the power into their own hands and uh, revitalize society and the economy. Thank you. So you, you already touched on uh, opportunities being created for young people, but uh, tell us how do we get them involved? So a massive way that we need to get involved um, or get young people involved is um, through incorporating them from the beginning. Um, too often do we see the way that young people are tokenized and brought in as a cosign after uh, policies or job opportunities are created. But what we do definitely need to see is young people um, envisioning what they want their future to be. But the problem is we don't even understand oftentimes what that future might look like because we're left out of framework planning, we're left out of policy development. And so we definitely need this deep intersectionality and incorporation um, of young people in the way that we vision and view our future. Um, and then from there, I think we really start seeing this buy-in. You know, we often, uh, you, we view it as, um, you know, once someone knows what's at stake for them, you know, they're sold and they now understand why it's so important that they fight for that. Um, so I definitely think that's a first step in, in kind of really bringing young people involved into everything. And then following that, um, it's definitely following their lead. 
Um, young people obviously don't have all the answers, but we definitely know what we want our future to look like. Um, and so I think definitely one, bring them in from the beginning and allow them to have spaces that aren't just tokenistic and two, follow their lead um, and guide it, guide them, um, guide us. Awesome. Well, we saw how you and many young people at the Global Climate Strike were calling to uproot the system. What is your message to the youth and to South Africa? So when we call for an uprootment of the system or an uprootment of the DMRE or anything to uproot, one thing I think is very important to remember is that as we uproot, we need to ensure that uh, these roots that, that are quite, uh, that are strangling us, um, we, that we uproot them carefully so as to not uh, destroy the the structures that so many people are dependent on today. We need to ensure that we pull out the roots carefully. We need to be fast, of course, but we need to be careful that we do not further um, destroy the livelihoods of people who are already suffering in frontline communities today. So that's what I mean when I say uproot the system and what I think and I hope my other uh, fellow activists believe as well. Um, we need to understand that the only way that we can uproot the system and uproot um, you know, other forms of injustices that intersect um, is together. Um, young people can't do it alone. We need people in power, decision makers, community members who are older than us, uh, NGOs, NPOs, to all work together, academics to come forward. Um, the only way that we do it is together. Um, and unless we do it that way, I don't really see a way forward. Um, but it needs to happen and it needs to happen soon. Well, Gabriel, thank you so much for joining us today from Project 90 by 2030. Thank you. Thanks so much. Increasing interest in deep sea oil and gas drilling puts the oceans and the coastal communities whose livelihoods depend on them at risk. Communities are most affected, must participate in the development projects that impact them. The Green Connection looks at how this can happen through environmental impact assessments. The oceans are fundamental to the livelihoods of millions of South Africans. However, increased interest in deep sea oil and gas drilling puts the oceans and the communities that depend on them at risk. Furthermore, the very communities which are most affected by these projects are often let off the conversation altogether. We reached out to Professor Mel Soman, the Head of Department of Environmental and Geographical Sciences at UCT and a member of the One Ocean Hub research team to discuss the limitations of the current laws and how they fail to protect the welfare of coastal communities. So the National Environmental Management Act is very clear about the requirement to ensure meaningful participation of all people in decisions that affect them and requires particular attention to disadvantaged communities and ensure that measures are put in place so that they can participate effectively. There are many examples where local communities have not been aware of proposals to undertake an activity and various kinds of development in their areas, or where a particular activity might have an impact on their livelihoods. This could be a proposal for mine prospecting, oil and gas exploration, mariculture and or tourism development, and many others. Often NGOs and researchers working in the area may alert communities about a particular proposal, but very often communities only learn about these proposals when the process is completed and or when construction begins. Good day, uh, I'm the community coordinator Neville Van Roy from the Green Connection. So I work with communities around the coastal towns. Um, Mossel Bay was one of such communities that I spoke to and the people on the ground really was uh, not informed or ill-informed and uh, the majority of the communities on the ground were totally um, not informed about this development coming into the surrounding areas. I looked through the environmental impact assessment. Most people want this kind of development because of the jobs. What the biggest problem is, is that there, there really are very few jobs particularly for, for those communities that really need them. And it's not me saying that, it's the environmental impact assessment itself. 
which said that most of the jobs would be for highly skilled people who are used to working on oil rigs. That is not even taking into consideration that those jobs would be of a temporary nature. And there may even be job losses within the uh, tourism industry. In fact, if you were to add up the gains and the losses in terms of jobs, people will lose jobs. I think one of the most important things is community level organization. If local communities are organized and they meet on a regular basis and there is a chairperson and a committee that's in place and this can provide a forum where various issues can be discussed, I think that would be an important step towards improving information flow in the community around potential projects and plans for, the, for, for that particular area. Of course, these local level organizations, whether it's a fishing cooperative or a resource committee or some such local level organization, often lack capacity and resources. And they may need to reach out to NGOs or other organizations that work in the area to help link them to information about these proposed developments and how they might engage with the public participation process. Of course, this should be the task of the consultants but very often communities are, are going to have to be proactive to make sure that their issues and concerns can be integrated into these processes. Where communities are aware of a development proposal and wish to be involved, but can, cannot, for example, attend the meetings that have been set up, maybe they're too far away, or maybe they're, face, they're, they're not face to face and they're online and they're not able to get access to the internet, they have every right to contact the consultant or the applicant, perhaps it's the mining company, and request an alternative method of engagement. They can also request summaries of the project description, the EIA process, the public participation process, and the EIA findings in their own language. I think what we need to realize is sometimes these local level organizations may need training and capacity development in order to function effectively. And therefore, they need to reach out to local government or to local NGOs working in the area to provide resources to assist them with this. The EIA process is not meant to put communities at a disadvantage before the law, but rather to allow for concerned voices to be heard before a project can proceed. Weighing up the environmental costs and benefits helps ensure that nobody is disproportionately affected by proposed activities. That was the Green Connection showing us the importance of community participation and co-management in energy development projects. When we come back from the break, we head into Faces of Environmentalism where we profiled people who are changing the environment in their corner of the world. Stay with us on Guardians of Gaia right here on Cape Town TV, Channel 263.